good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the service of the Coral Ridge Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, please know you're our honored guest. We don't come back to each and every opportunity you have. Uh, we ask you please turn off any electronic devices or put them on silent. <coughs> uh, if you are visiting with us, please fill out this H card and go pick up after services. I'd like to remind everyone of our worship service times. Uh, on Wednesday, we have a 10 a.m. and a 7 p.m. And then on Sundays, we have a 9.30 and Bible class, 10, 20 a.m. worship, and then 5 p.m. evening service. We have several on our sick list that are not feeling well. Uh, Chris Ainsworth is having heart problems, and we're having more tests run, but he's been here today, so it's good to see him. Joyce Spencer and family are all home with COVID. Elizabeth Lambert is home not feeling well. And Brian Dagan's dad is back home. Please remember our shut-ins, Tom and George Stidham, David Marshall, Ronnie Slayton, Diane Shelby, Jim Hamm, Dale Hewitt, Clyde and Sue Bowen, and Bobby Stevenson. Please can you remember these people in your prayers. You need a copy of our prayer list. It's located in the foyer. And if you know someone on that list and can update their status, we appreciate it. If you have any questions for Dale to answer from the pulpit, there is a box in the foyer. We have a new phone number for services. The info for that is in the bulletin. There will be a secret sister reveal on April the 22nd. There will be more details to come for that. Uh, our 11th 90th birthday party was yesterday, and thanks to those who attended the festivities, there was a very great turnout. Uh, please check your mailbox for mail and a couple cards here. Uh, for the family, Martha Sue Simpson, Dale, uh, dear quotes, Church Christ, thank you so much for the beautiful plant that was sent for Mom's funeral. It was very thoughtful, and I know Mom loved attending there and missed so many of you. Thank you again for your kindness. Sincerely, Belinda Palmer and Sheila Britt. And this one says, thank you for all the prayers, calls, cards, and food brought to us during my unexpected hospital stay and recovery. It's good to have a caring church family. This is signed by Sharon Kenakaba. And I'll put these in the foyer. Uh, this concludes our announcements. We'll now begin with a word of prayer. Generally, Father, we thank you for this beautiful day to be blessed us up, and we're so thankful that we're able to come before you and sing these songs of praise to you and study the force of your word. Lord, we pray that everything that we do here is done in accordance with your word. Pray, Lord, that you will be with those on our hearts and minds who are sick. Lord, there are several that were mentioned here this morning and tonight that are under the weather. We just pray, Lord, that you with them, that you will be with the, their caretakers, and they will help to heal them. And that uh, they will bring them all back to us soon. And we pray that you'll be with us throughout this day and throughout the future walks in life because of all our sins. In Christ's name, amen. 125, 125. One, two, five. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him, with him the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden and carry all your load? Let him have his way with me. His heart can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving it all? Have him save his son with a duty never fall. Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee. 
find a place of constant rest. Would you prove him true? A providential test. Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. Our song before the lesson of the hour is 216, 216. song is 214, 214. It's good to see you tonight. We're going to continue our discussion on the questions, some of the questions that you've had and answers. Next week, we're going to be looking at some things that you, questions you had concerning the Lord's Supper and also why do we have some versions, some of the later versions especially, that omit certain verses uh, in the Bible. Uh, and we'll uh, address that, Lord willing, next Sunday evening. Tonight, just a couple of questions we want to look at that pop up. And these are questions <coughs> that come up often, uh, especially when it comes to divorce and remarriage. But also the first one that we have, tattoos and body piercing. What does the Bible have to say about that? When we look at the subject... The answer is not a lot, especially in the New Testament. But we have to use caution here. And the reason we have to use caution here is we're talking about what does the Bible have to say. The issue isn't so much what we may like or what we prefer, but the question becomes what does the Bible have to say? It's not what I think about it, whether I like it or don't like it. So when we're talking about these things, we're not so much given our opinion as we go through these topics that are crucially important, whatever the topic may be, we want to state what the Bible has to say concerning these issues. Now, let me say that the Bible in the New Testament says nothing that I have found concerning body piercing or tattoos. There's one verse we're going to look at in the Old Testament, but nothing that I find in the New Testament. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there might be some problems with your influence uh, that would go into the realm of whether it becomes sinful or not. Uh, we have all seen individuals that have gotten quite carried away with piercings and tattoos all over their face or piercings all over their uh, upper body, as, as it may be. So as far as being able to get a job, your influence and things of that nature, that kind of takes on a whole uh, different set of questions there that one might ask whether one looks at something as being sinful or not. But strictly from the context of is there, is, does the Bible talk about it whatsoever? The only verse I can find is Leviticus 19, 28. There it says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. 
So there we have, of course, under the Levitical law, here, of course, in Leviticus. When you stop here, we see that the verse certainly forbids tattoos. No question about it. Says it outright. Can't, can't dodge that at all. But it also forbids body piercing. Now, quite often when people start talking about tattoos that the Bible condemns, they really kind of forget about the body piercing part. About uh, the piercing of the ears or other body piercings that may happen. The tongue or the navel or eyebrows, ears. So where do we draw that line if we're going to say that one is being prohibited according to the scriptures? Does not the other, the piercings, also follow as being prohibited by the scriptures? Again, the only scriptures we can find concerning this is Old Testament scripture. Uh, when you look at these things, a lot of ladies and men, I know this day and age, uh, have pierced ears. Uh, and so one would have to question, well, if you're going to condemn, the, again, the use of tattoos, what about these piercings? Obviously, the problem, we've got to put the verse in context. Uh, what else is forbidden in this particular chapter in Leviticus? Several things. Verse 19, don't mix livestock nor graze on the same field. Don't sow mixed seed in a field. Don't wear clothing of mixed fabric, linen and wool. Other things that we see, fruit from first uh, uh, three years shall be considered uncircumcised, not to be eaten. Fourth year, all goes to God. Fifth year, you can eat the fruit. Verse 27, don't shave around the sides of your head. Don't disfigure the edges of your beard. Do not pay attention to mediums and familiar spirits. Verse 32, you must rise when a person with gray hair walks into the room. So you begin to see that there are several things there that it's amazing how when folks really don't like something or disapprove of something, they run to a particular verse and pull it there and say, well, here it is. Here's the prohibition for not having tattoos. But what about everything else? It's kind of like the hundreds and hundreds of Levitical laws that we find within the scriptures. But what do people focus on when they talk about the law of Moses? Ten of them. They look at those top ten and they say, well, there's the laws that, you know, I've kept the ten commandments or we need to honor the ten commandments. Well, what about the other laws that are there that are just as important under the Levitical system of law? They're just as essential for those that were living in that time, but never were they intended for you and I. So that that we looked at in those verses, that doesn't even exhaust the chapter. Go back and certainly look at that if you like, but you can see that that's what we, how much do we violate when you begin to look at that? Some of those things, you know, wish there was a little more respect for uh, our, our elders, our, the elderly. Wish there was more respect uh, in, in certain ways there of what to do and what not to do. Some good advice there, but there's also some things there that clearly uh, are not essential as we get into the New Testament. So, in the New Testament, the law is given more in principles than in specific rules. Our task is to apply the principles to specific situations. That's why I said in the beginning when we're talking about tattoos or even body piercings. We need to talk about specific situations. You know, so many, of, again, individuals that uh, can't get jobs, they're unable to uh, earn a living because they refuse to, to change. You know, this is the way I look, whether it's hair, whether it is piercings, whether it is tattoo. And so, again, we have to look at specific situations uh, as we look at many of these old, uh, New Testament principles. Look at Romans chapter 14, for instance, when we talk about Christian liberty. Uh, this is a great chapter in discussing uh, these things. Again, when we talk about tattoos and body piercing, what about your personal influence? What about your offending someone? 
uh, leading someone astray in that way. We may disagree with choices that others make. We might even have a different opinion. But it's matters that each individual has to decide. Chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and others weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. You know, this is a whole other issue of questions today. You find some folks that are, are very much offended that they're vegan or vegetarians, and they go to the extreme with the animal protection type of things. That they say, not only are we not eating meat, but you shouldn't eat meat either, that it becomes sinful. And we know that, of course, it's not sinful. That God made these things, and it's, you know, Peter found out as well before going to the house of Cornelius, don't call these things sinful that God has said is good. And, and so each individual begins to decide on so many of these things when we look at these principles. One has to look at one's influence. Uh, all, Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to, to be thrown out and trampled under uh, foot by men. Uh, Matthew 5, 14. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. So influence is important. And then there's that first impression. And we've heard the expression, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So whether we're talking about family, whether we're talking about church, whether we're talking about a job market, you don't get a chance to make that, that first impression but one time. And so it's important. Our influence is important. Our first impression is important on how we come across in that way. Yes, it's real easy to stereotype folks. It's real easy to judge a book by its cover, so to speak. The way someone looks, uh, what they're wearing, uh, all of these things can sometimes influence the way that we look at them, how we judge them, how we shy away from them or maybe run away from them depending on how they look in that way. Uh, general appearance, again, dress, hair, personality, conscience. All of these things are important. Romans 14, 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, but whatever is not from faith is sin. I've told folks time and time again, if there are things that you have a problem with, then you need to stay clear of it. If people say, well, I don't believe you ought to eat at the building. Well, you know what? You shouldn't eat at the building then if that's the way you feel. But you need to be very cautious about condemning others that eat at the building. Unless you have scripture and you have that doctrinal evidence that says, listen, not only should I not eat at the but you shouldn't eat at the building either uh, in the manner that, that, that we do uh, from time to time. So, again, we can see as you go through chapter 14, the idea here of the conscience. First John 3, 20 and 21. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So we look at these principles. We can't use the passages like Leviticus 19, 28. We've got to apply the principles of the New Testament. Influence, first impression, conscience. These are all things that are important. Whether we're talking about body piercing, tattoos, or whatever it may be. As we're wanting to teach someone the gospel of Christ. Think about these things. Influence, first impression, conscience. Think about these aspects as we're raising our children and our grandchildren. Influence, first impression, conscience. Our second question of the night. People get divorced, scriptural or not. Are they free to remarry? This is a fairly simple answer to this. Although we'll dive into it a little more than just that one word. But just to kind of get into it quickly, no, they're not. And again, that is not a social, socially or politically correct statement to make in our day and age when there is such a high divorce rate in society today. Simply because something is high or our world gives several different reasons where one can divorce does not mean that God approves of those reasons. 
when he only gives but one. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, Satan for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And who shall, shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Sometimes people will say, well, if the innocent is free, then the guilty is also free. And I've always loved, Brother Warren used a handcuff illustration in discussing that when he debated on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He said, what's not taken into consideration when someone says, well, when the innocent is free from the handcuff, then the other is free. They're unlocked. They can go their way. What he says, and very rightly so, is they forget there is another two sets of handcuffs. Those sets of handcuffs are connected to God. Whereas you may be freed from the other, you're not free from the principles and the doctrine that God has set forth for the child of God today. Many different views on this. We've had several views that have been tossed around here over the years. But the fact is, I still center myself here on Matthew 5 or Matthew 19 as we go through these things to see exactly what the Bible has to say within the context of the New Testament. I know it's the old law, but when we look at these things like in Matthew 19 here, these are preparing folks for the church, preparing folks for the kingdom. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, saying to him, is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? They'd already said, Moses said it was okay to do so. He answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? This is an answer to another question that's going to come up when it comes to gay marriage or when it comes to many of the homosexual uh, things that are going on in our society today. He made them in the beginning, male and female. And that's important. Because we know that as we look to the principles of the beginning, how all of that unfolds and why God did what he did and made it very clear for this call, shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Cleave to his wife. Wife cleave to her husband. This is significant when we look at the principles that are stated outrightly, which we'll see when we go through the scripture, but also the inference that is there over and over again when we talk about relationship. So have you not read, he that made them in the beginning, made them male and female, and, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God is going to gather, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning it was not so. God never intended for it to be any other way than one man, one woman, for life. That's the way God intended it in the beginning, with that one exception as we go through that. I say to you, whosoever should put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marries another, committed adultery. In the King James, when you see the ending E-T-H, it is a continuing action in the Greek. That means it's not a one-time thing. It continues on as long as one is connected to the other. So, except it be for fornication, marry another, commit it, and continue to commit adultery as long as that relationship continues. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, does commit adultery. Both sides of it. Both sides are very clearly put forth in that way. So God intends for marriage to be for life. He hates divorce. It's violent, a treacherous act. He does not release the married from their marriage simply because they get a divorce. Unless divorce is for the grounds of fornication, any remarriage results in adultery. Folks, that's as plain teaching of the scriptures as I know. And again, I know there are those that have complicated it, that have twisted it, that have tried to make it fit their situation in life oftentimes because they're in the midst of a divorce or they're in the midst. I had a preacher, and I've mentioned it in class before, that for years and years had a firm stand 
And it was this stand on divorce and remarriage until his daughter was involved in a divorce. And then all of a sudden, it was time, he thought, to rethink and reexamine the scriptures. Very difficult to do that, folks. The scriptures hadn't changed. They hadn't changed back then, and they haven't changed today. What God expects and what God desires is very clear. We need to be teaching this to our children, to our grandchildren, and to everyone that will listen in hopes that we can bring this huge score down that's going on in the world today where folks just say, well, we're just not compatible anymore. We just don't get along anymore. Or this is going on or that's going on, so we'll just leave. And if you go into a relationship, if you go into a marriage with the idea, well, if it don't work out, we'll just get a divorce. You've almost put forth a self-fulfilled prophecy in doing so. And so we need to understand and look at these things uh, as we talk about the divorce, remarriage, or even the tattoo issue. Again, next Lord's Day evening, we'll address some more questions. Uh, some on the Lord's Supper and some on uh, the omission of certain verses in later versions uh, of the Bible. But again, if you have some questions... Or if some of the answers to these questions did not connect up exactly what you were asking, please ask again, uh, reissue that in that box, and we'll, we'll hit it up again. So tonight, again, if you're here and you're subject to the invitation, I want you to certainly let us know as we get together and stand and sing our invitation. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and Verse number 23, 2 3. By Christ's reading in Christ's restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord unto.
thankful, especially for this privilege that we had to come here and sing songs and pray to God to be. And now the Heavenly Father, as we surround the table again, we're going to give you thanks for your son who died upon the cross. And we can take this bread that represents his body that hung on the cross. It is a thank God can. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we continue to give thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ, his precious blood that was shed upon the cross. We thank you for that great sacrifice that he made for us. We pray that we will do this in a way that's pleasing unto thee. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 And if anyone would like to give, they can be one of the elders. Please stand and sing 417, 417 to the first verse after that will be dismissed in prayer. I hope everyone has a great week. Come back Wednesday, 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. 417, first verse after that will be dismissed. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by Father, we just thank you again for this time of evening service and Bible study and pray to continue to learn and study your word and figure out what you want us to do in your life, dear Lord, and pray that we'll have the faith to follow through and do what you want us to do. We pray for the sick and others, the ones that saw loved ones that you might comfort them and be with them and let them know we're still caring of them. As to be, be us to Meet again and forgive us our many unforgiving sins. Christ, we pray.